Hello, welcome to everybody to the Princess Grace Irish Library. I'm delighted to be here with author Anne Chambers in Ireland and also our intern Gina, who uh, we're here to welcome author and um, screenwriter and writer of plays and outstanding biographer. So welcome Anne to you. Thank you for joining us at the library. Well, thank you very much, and I hope I, I live up now to that uh, great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you will indeed. And thank you for talking to us. I just want to give a little bit of background on Anne for our listeners. Anne is an author of 10 biographies, including the best-selling Grace O'Malley, the biography of Ireland's Pirate Queen, 1530 to 1603, which we're going to talk about now. And Anne's books have been translated into many languages and have been the subject of TV and radio documentaries. And in 2018, Anne was awarded the Wild Atlantic Way Words Festival Hall of Fame Award in recognition of her contribution to Ireland's literary tradition. So we're really honored to have you here with us, Anne. So to sh shoot right into it, uh, the biography on Grace O'Malley, that became a milestone in Irish publishing and the catalyst for the restoration of Grace O'Malley to political, social and maritime history. And Grace, or Granul, to use her Irish name, was one of the most remarkable female leaders in Irish history, a renowned and feared sea captain who fought her enemies, both Irish and English, in the 16th century. So these are all facts that are well established now, Anne, and mainly thanks to your book, but that wasn't always the case. Grace O'Malley was persona non grata for a time. Can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Well, lovely to be here and to talk about Grace O'Malley in the, I'm sure, beautiful surroundings of Monte Carlo. Um, yes, I found Grace O'Malley languishing, really. You know, she had been airbrushed out of uh, history. As a young girl growing up uh, and going on our holidays to the west coast of Ireland around Clue Bay, I heard all the stories and legends about her like every other child had. But yet when I went to school, she never appeared in my school history books. So I was always fascinated, really, and wondered, did she really exist or was she just from Ireland's legendary past? So fast forward to my early 20s, working in banking in Dublin, and I decided with the encouragement of my then boss, Dr. T.K. Whittaker, to go and see. And if I can just tell you or read you, the first thing I found in the Elizabethan state papers about Grace O'Malley, if I had written a fictional novel, they would have said it had been melodramatic nonsense. So I'll just tell you one thing. The first thing that I came across and set me out on my own voyage to find her, which took four years, and this was written by a man who had actually met with Grace O'Malley in 1577 in Galway. And a very famous man, indeed, his name was Sir Henry Sidney, and he was the English Lord Deputy of Ireland at the time. And this is what he wrote. And it's quite Shakespearean in its tone, so bear with me a moment. There came to me a most famous feminine sea captain called Grania Imaya, with three galleys and 200 fighting men. She brought with her her husband, for she was as well by sea as by land, well more than Mrs. Mate with him. This was the most notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. So that one little entry in the English state papers, which unlike the Irish historians, did remember Grace O'Malley because they recorded in these 400 year old documents, many, many aspects of her life as she interconnected with various English military men and administrators in Ireland, and finally then with Queen Elizabeth I, the first in Greenwich in 1593 at the end of her life. So she brought me on a wonderful voyage, which really has never finished because, as you said, the book has been in print since first published in 1980 and continues to, I think, inspire lots of other people as she inspired me. That's fantastic. And uh, so you uh, subsequently did a, um, it's, we actually have actually your books here in the library, if I can show that. That's the original one published in 1979. And you signed this and you sent that to Princess Grace 
And yes. she replied, can you tell us you have a letter? I have indeed in her beautiful handwriting and indeed in comparison to my own. And there it is. My, my sister was actually uh, a guest princess brace for years and there's a long story behind that that i won't go into now and hearing that we were you know my sister was from mayo she she lived with the family for two years in the palace in Mon in monte carlo and during that time i was finishing my draft in 1979 you can imagine was like typed with tipex here and there <laughs> and martina my sister was telling princess grace about it princess grace said she'd love to read it so this typed tipex version went off to the palace in monte carlo so i was so embarrassed by it by the moment the book came out in the 1980 i sent her this copy and i had this lovely letter which i i certainly do prize today and indeed i might send you a copy of it for your records in the princess grace library uh, with uh, some other books and i i was delighted I spoke to her on a couple of occasions when she was here in Ireland. And of course, we, myself and my sister, were there to greet uh, the, the, His Royal Highness the Prince when he came to Ireland there a few years ago. And we met him and just talked about, about old times. But I think it's wonderful as well, if I may mention that, um, you know, I'm sure she would have been very, very supportive of this now because she did know about Grace O'Malley. She must have had heard it, I think, from her own father or grandfather. And it's lovely to think that these statues of the two Graces, as I call them, will be soon erected in Newport in County Mayo in connection with the two Graces uh, who came, who, whose origins are from there. So that was a lovely uh, and I, you know, I, I, it's something that's very dear to my heart, uh, uh, and particularly for the connection with my sister, with her as well, who used to meet her in Paris when she was there with Princess Stephanie. So there's another little story there that uh, I'm sure Grace O'Malley would have smiled at too. <laughs> Indeed, that's wonderful. What a lovely anecdote and, and such a personal touch by Princess Grace to, to have taken interest in your book and, and read it. Uh, that's fantastic. And we have the subsequent book, the 40th anniversary special edition um, in 2019, uh, sorry, 18. And there's another one even, it's it's into its 11th edition now, which uh, is no yes, surprise is. given the- this Exactly. But I think what we have to say here, it's not so much me, it's just that Grace O'Malley seems now to inspire. She She's turned into this great iconic inspirational woman. And I think for women today, she is a great headline act. And I'd like to explain that a little bit. We've had great female lead leaders uh, over the centuries. You know, you have Queen Elizabeth, who very appropriately, I think, Grace O'Malley met in 1593. You have Catherine the Great. You have all these great um, women. But none of them really were powerful by sea. And I think that's what sets Grace O'Malley apart from other women in, in history. You know, the sea was always a barrier particularly to women. You know, there was great superstition about the sea that women really on board ship were the harbingers of squalls and storms, for example. You know, it was a very, very difficult environment for a female physique. And Grace O'Malley completely transcended that. And I think in doing that, she showed to us women who are following behind, you know, that barriers are there to be broken down. You don't have to shortchange your own femininity to be good or better in a male environment, but you can use the attributes, I think, of being female to either supersede those who wish who may, might wish to stop you from getting on. So I love to think of her as that. And secondly, I am so delighted now that hopefully through this, through her biography, that unlike me, that children now in Ireland and abroad, because I get thousands of emails over the years from students who are now able to study her uh, as a factual figure of history. And that's what started me off on my own voyage to try and Re, re adjust the imbalance that was uh, mitigated against her and make her a figure of history. The good and the bad, she wasn't all good like all of us. She had her downsides, she had her bold sides. She had her, but she is the inspirational icon, I think, for us women today. And certainly um, the environment that she was uh, leading in uh, was very different then. The, the history of Ireland comes into your book 
Can you tell Absolutely. us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yes. Well, to go back to what yes. I said, that was one of the reasons why she was airbrushed from history, because Grace O'Malley did not conform to what later generations of historians wanted to be an Irish heroine. And why did she not conform? Because her time did not conform. Ireland in the 16th century was a divided country, divided into around 40 different little kingdoms or chieftaincies, each fighting one another. No male chieftain had the, uh, they were like headless chickens really, running around fighting themselves when they didn't see the bigger picture of a very strong and powerful neighbor who were looking on the state of Ireland, which they looked on and indeed Elizabeth viewed it as a backdoor to her continental, an unprotected backdoor to her continental enemies which was true because the Spanish tried to um, uh, make a foothold in Ireland twice or three times indeed during her reign. And secondly, the vast pasture lands and the beautiful forests that was Ireland at the time, that was looked on with, a, with a, an undertaker's, if you like, viewpoint by people who wanted to make their fortune. It was much easier to jump the Irish Sea instead of sailing across to the new world in America to make your fortune. So these things combined. And when Elizabeth, uh, the Elizabethans decided to conquer Ireland, Grace O'Malley and the other chieftains of that period had only one motivation and could have only one motivation, and that was one of survival and the protection of their families, their followers, and their lands. So they had to make very, very hard decisions during that period that didn't fit in with the more noble um, uh, decisions that had to be made. You know, we always think of Irish, hist uh, Irish history, the Irish fighting the English and trying to stay independent. That didn't work for the 16th century. So that is one reason why Grace O'Malley was written out of history she didn't conform to that and the second as i said because she pursued what was really then even by irish law looked on as a male only um, career if you like by land and by sea now she you know she she is born into the nobility of ireland she is the daughter of a chieftain so her her life really um, had a prescribed formula to it she would have to have made which she did and a, a, a marriage over which she would have no control, just like her English sisters or French sisters, uh, the, the, the children of the aristocracy, and particularly the females in the arist arist aristocracy had to be, go where they were told to go. So her first marriage was to a neighboring chieftain, Donal on, on O'Flaherty, a bit of a wild lad, really, and uh, ended up really with Grace taking control of his clan because he was such a head the ball really that he did nothing on a fight with his neighbors and brought great hardship on his followers. And Grace seemed to take it over. But when he was killed in a, in a, in a, in a, a feudal tribal feud, Grace did avenge, avenge his, um, his uh, death. And you know, the lovely castle of Hens Castle that's what he was fighting over to possess. And because Donald was quite brave, he was always known as the cock of Flaherty. And when he died and Grace actually took back the castle from the people who had actually killed him, the castle was quickly renamed Hens Castle. Oh. And that's the name it bears today. And as uh, you can see it today in lo the lovely Loch Carib on the, uh, on, near the west, in the west of Ireland. That's wonderful. So that was her first marriage. And then her second marriage, she she had uh, a son. I wanted to to bring up uh, the fact that she she was um, um, quite respected eventually by Queen Elizabeth the First. Can you tell us that story and how she got to meet her? Which is okay. Well, I think there's, there's there's three three as are three sections in Grace O'Malley. There's the first marriage that I I mentioned with Donald O'Flaherty, and by Donald she had two sons and one daughter. And then you have the independent uh, Grace O'Malley in between husbands, if you like. And this is where the fable, if you like, of the great pirate queen, you know, pirating up and down the coasts of Ireland, and you know, plundering everywhere she went. There was a certain uh, truth in that, but you know. In every maritime culture, including Monaco, uh, you know, including Cornwall, the South China Seas, any maritime culture always had a little bit of plunder and piracy on the side. 
But this, and, and the O'Malley's were no different. You look and see them in the annals of the four masters. They're always referred to uh, with the sea, of course, is in their DNA. And indeed it was in, D, in Grace O'Malley's DNA, the sea. But that plundering and piracy was part and parcel of maritime life, no matter where you went. So you have this independent Grace O'Malley where she becomes very, very wealthy and more and more men are attracted to her service because she's able because she's a good mariner, and most importantly, because she's a su successful. You don't follow somebody in the 16th century if they're not successful. Then comes her third marriage. As the English administration began to move out of Dublin, where they always were, and moving into the more remoter parts of, like Grace O'Malley's country around Clew Bay, Grace O'Malley realized that Clear Island, where she had really established herself as this great pirate queen, was no longer, um, you know, safe. And she put her eye on Richard in Iron Burke, the great Richard in Iron, a very powerful chieftain of the Mayo Burkes, B-O-U-R-K-E-S. And it was said that she married Richard for one year certain. That was to say, if either party wished, they could remove themselves from the marriage, because as you possibly may or may not know, the old Brehan or Gaelic law allowed for divorce, you know, uh, and it was part and parcel of Gaelic life. And it was said also that after one year, Grace shouted down from the ramparts to Richard to say, Richard Burke, I dismiss you, taking his castle of Rockfleet in lieu of her marriage dowry. Now, that was one of the great legends and stories about Grace and Ali, but as I found out, it may well have happened, but they did get together because they combined their forces to try and resist the English incursion that was coming out of Dublin. So Richard and Grace became very, very powerful to such a degree that they, the English were forced almost to make um, um, to make peace with them and to allow Richard to become the overall chieftain of the county of Mayo. And I found in Westport House, in the home of one of the descendants of Grace O'Malley, extraordinary documents around that time that had never been opened since their authors put quill to parchment 400 years before that. And I opened them and I can tell you, it was like opening an Aladdin's cave to get to this information. You know, it, the biography is a great, um, it's a great journey, really. Very, very exciting. Now, mind you, you can go up a couple of cul-de-sacs here and there, but you <laughs> always miss, you're always hopeful that you will find something. And that cache of documents, there were around 15,000 in all, but the ones I wanted was around 1,000. And, it, you know, I had to go through them and decipher them. The old English in them was uh, very, very old indeed. It was very Shakespearean, as I, as I read out for you at the beginning of our talk. And that threw great light both on Grace O'Malley, her husband, and on their son, Tippet Nalung, Toby of the ships, who was born aboard his mother's ship on one of her voyages. And also it was said that North African pirates on the same day of his birth attacked her ship off the southwest coast of Ireland and that she had to come up from her birthing bed and take a gun and shoot at the um, Algerian pirates. Now, they were so taken about, back about, um, about this mirage that had come up from under deck. And hearing the child crying in the background, they left their attack. And it is one of the great features. And I was wondering, did it exist? And then I found an old document written in Latin suggesting exactly the same thing uh, of the period. So it's lovely to see where fact and folklore coincide. And between Grace O'Malley and her son, certainly that happens. Now, this son, Tibbo Nalong, or Toby of the Ships, I, uh, his biography is coming out now next month. Uh, in paperback, and we're calling it Lord Mayo. And he's buried in Ballantubber Abbey, the famous abbey, I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, in, in the west of Ireland, uh, where indeed a lot of his family are buried. He was an extraordinary guy. He was the one that took after his mother. And when she was becoming uh, oh, um, too, I suppose, old to keep on board, he was the one that took over. But I know what you want to ask me, and I know I'm, I'm diverting a little bit there. Why did she go to Queen Elizabeth I? And it was all to do with this boy, Thibaut Nalong, her youngest son. So in 1593, Grace O'Malley really had been up against 
the, I suppose the one man in her life who did get the better offer, and that was Sir Richard Bingham, the governor, English governor of Connacht. She led three separate rebellions against him, not against the English, but personally against him. He had a problem, I think, with women anyway, and he certainly had a huge problem with Grace O'Malley. He couldn't, couldn't understand this woman leading an army. He couldn't understand this woman leading by sea. He, she tells us herself, because she does leave us a potted autobiography when she goes to the court of Elizabeth, she's asked 18 questions and she answers them. So I found these and I'm saying, here's Grace O'Malley speaking. She's telling us, mind you, she's very, very adroit at what she says. She, when they ask her about various things, if they don't pronounce it or write it properly, she says she doesn't know because she was afraid the English would take it from her. So she's very, very astute in her correspondence with the Queen. Bingham actually killed her eldest son, uh, and that was uh, uh, Donal O'Flaherty, and she talks herself, as indeed any mother would, of counting 12 deadly wounds on her son's body. And then he went against Grace, and he caused, as she said, a gallows to be erected where she thought she would end her days. But all the chieftains of Mayo shows you what an impact she had made on everybody. They came together and offered hostages if he released her, which he did. Then he went against her youngest son and he imprisoned him, Tibbet, for uh, on a charge of treason, which of course meant death. And Tibbet was thrown into Athlone prison. And Grace knew that there was nobody now left in the English administration whom she could appeal to. So she decided to go over Bingham's head and go to his boss, Queen Elizabeth I of England. And that is the reason Grace O'Malley went, not as, as fiction would have it, you know, I'm the great Queen of the West demanding to see the Queen of England. You think about it today. If you tried to get an audience with Queen Elizabeth II today, you would have to go through a very, very different way. How did Grace O'Malley know how to get to this Machiavellian, get her way through this Machiavellian web that surrounded Queen Elizabeth I? This is where I feel Grace O'Malley is quite extraordinary. And I have to go back to the sea again. To landlubbers like us, we look on the sea as a barrier. To Grace O'Malley and anybody to do with the sea, it is a highway. It is a highway to trade, it is a highway to new cultures, new languages, but it also is a highway to information. It's like the tech information today. The sea in the 16th century brought the gossip brought the news. Grace O'Malley was so clued in into what was happening politically in Spain and in England that she knew her way how to get to Elizabeth. Now there's a beautiful castle in County Tipperary called Ormond House. And indeed I gave a talk on both Grace O'Malley and another lady who was there, Eleanor Countess of Desmond some years ago. It's the only Tudor mansion left in Ireland. And it was erected by Queen Elizabeth's cousin, a relation to Anne Boleyn called Black Tom, Earl of Ormond. Now, Black Tom, Earl of Ormond, also had a connection with Grace O'Malley through land he owned over in Clube. So Grace O'Malley had the awareness to know that Black Tom was a special friend of Queen Elizabeth, very influential in her court. And when I found the letter he wrote of introduction for Queen Elizabeth, I knew exactly how Grace O'Malley had got to see it. And that little letter was still there in the English state papers. And it said to Lord Burley, who was Queen Elizabeth's Secretary of State, I'm giving you this introduction to this woman and I leave you, leave it to yourself to see what you want to do with her. My goodness, that's So with this little letter up, it, it, it guarantees her protection because you know, as she sailed up the Thames, as Grace O'Malley sailed up the Thames, she would have seen hanging out over the Thames, the skeletons in cages of pirates. Pirates were never killed. They were hung up in as cages over the Thames until they died of starvation and their bones were picked clean. She knew exactly what if she was charged with piracy or if she was charged with rebellion, what would happen to her? But she did have this letter from Black Tom, Earl of Ormond. And who became fascinated with her was Lord Burley, William Cesar, uh, Queen Elizabeth's great secretary of state. And I found her letters to him. They're called petitions. And she's asking really for protection against 
Elizabeth's own general in Ireland, uh, Richard Bingham, and she's asking that her son be released from prison, that he had done no wrong. Uh, and Burley doesn't know what to make of this. And this great statesman, I found, he actually, with his own quill and, and, and ink, was trying to work out her, her uh, doodle, her uh, connections with her husbands, how many children she had. And he did a little... Um, traced her family tree and I thought of this man doing this before he allowed her go to see Queen Elizabeth. He, he made out 18 uh, questions for Grace O'Malley to answer and that is where she answers all about who she was, her father, her mother, her children, her various possess possessions she had and what had happened to her son that he was in prison for treason. After that obviously uh, Burley cleared the way and, and in July 1593, after hanging around uh, London for a few weeks, Grace O'Malley finally met with Queen Elizabeth I in Greenwich in July. That's absolutely wonderful. And I, I, we would love to hear more about that. And I'm just conscious that the time is going to tick away here and we're, we're going to get caught off. We will have to have you to the library. One thing, though, you're connected with the Grace O'Malley tall ship. And that is touring Absolutely. Ireland at the moment, and you've been on board it. And we had a question: uh, Does the name do it justice? Oh my goodness! I think Grace. I think the most appropriate name. Uh, there is only one I a maritime icon in Ireland. You know, we did export a lot of famous seafarers, but the one that stayed in Ireland is Grace O'Malley. I think the Atlantic Youth Trust did the right thing in 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 renaming this ship Grace O'Malley, and I think it's going to be mark out a fantastic future for the youth of Ireland. You know, after COVID, after everything that has happened, to be able to set sail from whatever port you like in a ship called Grace O'Malley, I think is going to bring out the best in our youth. And I think it's going to bring them into contact with nature. They're going to be in contact with the sea. They're going to be in contact with the environment. And I think in a way as well, through research that will be done on it, it will help us all, I think, to understand our environment and to think that it's named in honour of Grace O'Malley, it can only be but successful. Great thing. I will put details of the charity, the Atlantic Youth Trust, uh, in with your podcast. Thank you so much, Anne. We're about to get cut off there. We'll have you back. Thank you again. Thank you. Lovely to see you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.